uh, parrot that we started, uh, I, I feel bad. I feel like I made it more complicated than it is. I just think, thought that it, it somehow it, it it was foreign material. So we uh, sort of needed to absorb it better and uh, let it sink in. So uh, basically what we, we did have a lot of, there's a lot of debate between the commentaries as well, which also made it more complicated than I would have liked. Um, because what, wherever you step, there's a machlekes. Wherever every 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 line that you read in the Mishnah is basically an argument between the commentaries how to translate it, and it does make it quite hard to uh, to go through the Mishnah. But if we want to summarize the uh, the Mishnah, so the first part of the Mishnah talked about berchas koyanim, which is a very interesting topic uh, in its own right because. Uh, the Mishnah tells us about Kayanim doing Berchas Kayanim more than once a day. And uh, this is an area of big debate. Is it even a mitzvah for Kayanim to do it more than once? Like, for example, if a Kayanim davened in one shul and then he goes into another shul, would he have a mitzvah to do Berchas Kayanim? In fact, there's even a question in some of the halachic uh, books regarding. Would he make recite a bracha, even if he's allowed to do it? In fact, there's a taisvis that questions if you're even allowed to do berchas kainim more than once, um, because it might be considered bal taisif. So taisvis asks, how could you even do it more than once? And taisvis explains that bal taisif, bal taisif means you're not allowed to add uh, to the Torah's laws. And uh, the uh, taisvis in Rosh Hashanah, he brings down that it's actually not a problem because bal is when you add a addition to an actual mitzvah, not when you do a mitzvah twice. But in any event, there's a lot of discussion, and basically what it comes out would be that our Mishnah is either saying that there is a mitzvah uh, to do berchas kainim whenever you, whenever you can, and in these scenarios, the rule was to do it four times, and that would be appropriate. Or it might be rabbinic, that the extra times more than once a day would only be rabbinic. Or there's even the option, there's even the understanding among the commentaries that the extra times are only a minhag. So again, our Mishnah spoke about doing Berchus Kainim up to four times a day. Is that really an obligation? Is really subject to the commentaries, how they understand it and based on different halachic laws and uh uh, if you're even you know, if you're even supposed to recite a bracha on the other times, if you go to do berchas kainim more than once, uh, does it make a difference if you went to if you uh, did berchas kainim at one tefillah, one one of the prayers, would then you be allowed to do berchas kainim at another prayer, a different prayer later on in the same day? That maybe has more validity than if you go to two shuls and they did the same prayer. And here you already fulfilled your berchas kayanim at the prayer. Why are you, you know, when you're going to the next shul and they're doing the same prayer, maybe then could be that there's not a mitzvah to go and do it again. Or it could be questionable if you can recite a bracha. So there's discussion about it in the commentaries, in the halachic books. Uh, we have two questions over here. So David, I think you were first. Yeah, if you went to a different, sh if we went to a second shul after you daven shachris and put on tefillin, you couldn't go into a second shul and put on tefillin again and daven shachris again. But but you, but you could still do the berchas kayanim. You could still go up there when the when the chazan gets up to berchas kayanim. You know the kayan could could go up and do it. And I, I believe the minag is they do it. Uh, you know, if you if they do go to it, but I but I, I'm I'm sharing with you the discussion among commentaries that there is question about reciting the bracha an additional time if it would be appropriate. But um, uh, in Lubavitch, it's a it's it, it is quite common because what happens is uh, there's always like more than one minion going on in a shul, so you end up hanging out there and schmoozing with so, and then all of a sudden there's another brachas kainim that they're uh, that 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 you know that's going to be taking place, and they call you to wash. You know, you, they get you to wash your hands. So I think it 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 happens often in a like in a like seven seventy or you know places where they have more than one minion. 
Um, and then they have places where there's a minion upstairs and they don't have a kayin. So they call someone from downstairs who just finished davening to come up and do berchas kayinim for the upstairs because the upstairs doesn't have any kayin. So seemingly the minhag is to go and recite the bracha and so on. Although I do wonder, if, I mean, I wonder if I, I should really look it up and see what the actual halacha is. Uh, uh, like I would uh, take a look maybe in the Mishnah Brura or in the, the uh, Piske Chuvais, you know, to see the final uh, discussion about, what, you know, what, what should be done in such a scenario. Actually, Mordechai is a Kayin, I think, right? And and he probably right. has. Uh, have, have you ever looked into this or, or uh, heard about this issue of reciting the bracha a second time? Uh, no, but what I was going to mention is in 556 Crown Street, there's base Levy upstairs, and there's a Sephardi Shul downstairs, and uh, the Sephardi Birkas Kohani were often in the Ashkenazim, so occasionally they'll I'll go upstairs to try to get a Kohen to talk, and even uh, when it's uh, even when it's not, say, like the Chabad Minha to uh -huh. talk on uh -huh. that day. So they pull you down, basically. They pull you to right. come down to Davin with them. Uh -huh. Okay, all right. Anyway, Ezra had a question. Yes, Ezra. It's not a question. I, oh. in, uh, uh, a situation that existed when I lived in Israel, <clears throat> I would go to the Kotel on Shabbat, and there was a coin who would go to each and every minion and act as coin for people uh -huh. for that particular minion. And he would, you know, he would do Your everything. Yeah. Right. And everybody right. and everybody knew it because they, they right. were all prepared for it. So uh-huh. Uh-huh. So uh that's 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 very important information because what that means is that the minhag is seemingly that a kayin recites the bracha every time they do berchas kayanim. Like that's the seemingly the final uh the final minhag, which I, that's what I've seen. Um the only question is 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 it uh is this the appropriate thing or is this just because of our ignorance and that's you know that's what happens but in your scenario ezra where if it's being done in at the kaisal i'm sure there's great scholars that would have told him off you know if if that wasn't appropriate so um you know so i guess and if it was like done often you know enough there's definitely a, uh you know scholars that are there that see it uh so it's that would be every shabbat i used to go every shabbat and right. i used to do it every shabbat every shabbat so i uh, you know it sounds like that that sounds like a very reliable uh you know story that uh prove that that proves the halacha you know there's a concept of a misa a story is almost like better proof than a halachic uh, ruling the halachic ruling, you sometimes uh, can have qualifications, like, you know, sometimes it's, it has to be qualified. But if it's a story, it's like, a, you know, a solid proof. So, Yasha Koyach, Ezra, that sounds, sounds, sounds like a, a good source. I will, um, but I, I will try to look up in the Piske Chuvais just to see what, if they uh, discuss this. Because here, it is, it is mentioned as questionable about saying the bracha again. Now, that's really the main question. In other words, Taisvis tells us it's definitely not a problem of, you know, doing it again, uh, you know, uh, Taisif and our Mishnah basically says it because it's clearly acceptable. But I guess the only question would be if it would be considered a bracha, an issue of a bracha, which is discussed uh, in the, um, I think it's the Maram Shik, well, great big halachic, uh, great halachic rabbis, who, you know, um, uh, uh, who, who, Put a question on the, the, the if if the bracha is recited. Okay. Well. Anyway, that's the brachas I have a question for you. Yeah. <clears throat> so when he says, uh, right, and he's standing in front of that particular group, is amo that particular group or is it everybody? Oh, interesting. You mean because they're all there, uh, whoever is well, in know, the that, group. He's doing it specifically for that group. You know, so the thing is, right. here is the group of of uh, the minion that he's participating. So it, it's brought down that the Birchas Kayanim 
nothing can stop it. And even a solid wall will not block the Berchas Kayanim from having its impact. That means someone who's like behind the solid wall will also receive that bracha. So uh, uh, the only thing that could stop it is some is is something that's is if they don't face each other, if they're not facing him, and if uh, and if maybe there's like uh, idols that are blocking that are in between, or you know maybe a uh, impure or something impure that's uh, uh, in between. But basically, yeah. everyone would be included. So the only issue would be if they're not facing them, you know, for the Berchus Kayanim. But, uh, but other than that, it's everyone would be included. So that would be the, uh, that's what it's, it's brought down. Okay, so the, uh, getting back to our Mishnah. So then our Mishnah spoke about the Ma'amadis. And, and, you know, we, we've been talking about these Ma'amadis now two days already. And the Ma'amadis were um, uh, uh, basically some type of a representation of Klal Yisrael, of the Jewish people in the Beis Hamigdash. And we had a discussion if the Ma'amadis were Kayanim Leviyim and Yisraelim, or was it only Yisraelim? In other words, who was really part of this Ma'amadis, this representation? Did they did they choose um, um, only Israelites? In other words, we have the Kayanim and the Levites that are going to do the service in the temple. Now we want the regular Jewish people to have to be part of the sacrifice as well. So are they? Um, uh, is so we take a group of them and tell them you have this week in the Beis Hamikdash and you are representing Klal Yisrael. So the question is, do we also take a chunk of Kayanim and Leviim for that purpose as well, or? Uh, if that's so, are the Kayanim and Levium that are there doing the service, are they part of the Ma'amadis? In other words, are they part of this concept of being representatives of Kalal Yisrael or not? Maybe Israelites could go to the Beis HaMikdash and they represent the entire Jewish people, including the Kayanim and Levium. Again, the Kayanim and Levium and Yisraelim that live all around the world are basically sending some Israelites to go to the base Hamikdash and do the service. So the Israelites are representing all the Kainim and Levim. Fine, they're, 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 they're doing their job. They're representing Kainim, Levim, and Yisraelim all around the world. The Kainim, Levim doing the service. The Israelites are doing the Ma'amadis, and they are representing all of Klai Yisrael. Or possibly the Kainim and Levim that are in the base Hamikdash they might be part of this Ma'amadis as representatives for the Kayanim. The Kayanim are representing the Kayanim. The Leviim are representing the Leviim. And the Israelites that we're now sending to the Beis HaMikdash, are the ones that live in Yushalayim, of course, those are the ones going to the Beis HaMikdash, they are representing the Israelites. So is so, so the question really is, are we, are we considering the Israelites only representing Israelites, or are the Israelites representing everyone? And this is a debate between the the commentaries uh, and uh, one of the uh, um, there is a way of explaining it the, the the difference between these two opinions. If you hold that the Kayanim are representing the Kayanim, the Leviim are representing the Leviim, and the Israelites are representing the Israelites, that would be because this is not the typical scenario of shlichus sending someone as a shliach shal adam kamaisa as an emissary that the person you send as an emissary is like you yourself are there because if it was a law of shlichus if you were sending an emissary and the person you send is considered as if you you are there as if you are the one who went there's no problem for a Kayhain and a Levi to send an Israelite as a representative, as a Shliach. You don't have to send a Shliach that's only your type. You could send a Shliach that's an Israelite. Who cares? You're a Kayhain, he's a Levi, it doesn't matter. You're from Shevet Ruvain, he's from Shevet Shemain, you're from a different tribe, it doesn't matter. You send a Shliach, a Shliach shall Adam to my side. The Shliach is like you. So if you send a Shliach, 
uh, th that should be fine. An Israelite could be a shliach for all of the Kayanim and Leviim around the world. However, if this is a law of representing, not a not from the category, not through the mechanism of shlichus, it's not using the mechanism of shlichus, but it's rather using the mechanism of a new type of law called ma'amadais, where you have representation by the base on the gush, that it's part of the laws of karbanais and the, the laws of tishmeru standing by the carbon, and you need to be represented. There needs to be representation by the carbon. If that's so, that it's not through the laws of shlichus, then it could be that an Israelite represents Israelites, and the Kayanim represent the Kayanim, and the Levium have a representative for Levium. And so therefore, each one would need their own representation. Again, if it was through the mechanism of the laws of shlichus sending an emissary, then there shouldn't be a difference between a koyeh and a levi Yisrael. But if there's a new type of category of representation, which has to do with ma'amadais, and has to do with uh, the law of karbanais, and standing by your karban, so then it would fall under a different type of, uh, uh, of, of rule. And, and that, according to that rule, there would be a reason to have a... Kayhain there, the Kayanim there as representatives, the Levian there as representatives, and the Israelites as representatives, because each one represents their group. And this would be based on the fact that the Jewish people are called an Am Tlisai. We are called a nation of three. And if we're called a nation of three, that would be a reason why we should have representatives. In, a, in 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 groups of three. In other words, we have a we have three different representatives for Kla Yisrael. You have a group of Kayanim, a group of Leviim, and a group of of Yisraelim. And so that would be a way to explain the difference between these group these these commentaries. It would explain the difference between the commentaries if they hold that Kayanim, Leviim, and Yisraelim are all uh, part of the Mahmudis, or is it only the Israelites that are part of the Mahmudis? So this would be a a way of explaining that. Now, uh, the the Mishnah uh, then told us about how important it is that we have these representatives there, and who started the representatives, the Nevi'im or Rishonim. And I mentioned yesterday, of course, that it really is uh, based on, on on a Pasuk in Chumash, but it doesn't say from the Pasuk, it doesn't tell us how many Mishmaris, how many groups of people would be uh, would be involved in uh, doing the service in the Beis HaMikdash. And uh, the Mishnah tells us that the Nevi'im made 24. And it turns out that there's 24 Kayim, groups of Kayim, 24 groups of Nevi'im, and 24 groups of Yisraelim. And uh, the Mishnah is a little vague with regard to who would go up to Yerushalayim from the Israelites. And so because of that, there's a lot of discussion. Is it only the Israelites that live in Yerushalayim? or the ones that live near Yerushalayim, or is it all the Israelites would go to Yerushalayim and it's only the old people who couldn't make it to Yerushalayim that they would stay in their cities? But basically, if you if you read this Mishnah, what you see is that at one point it talks about um, the uh, the fact that Israelites need to be there. There was a Maimad in Yerushalayim and of Kainam, Levim, and Yisraelim. And then the Mishnah says that the Israelites would go to their own shul in their city. So there's like a contradiction in the Mishnah. One place it says they go up. Again, the first wide line in the Gemara says that the, the Israelites with the Kayanim and Levim, they all go up to Yerushalayim. There's a Maimad in Yerushalayim. So it means Israelites were there. It says clearly Yisraelim. There were Yisraelim going as Maimad, which is, again, is this represent representation in Yerushalayim. But then the Mishnah two lines later says, that uh, the Kayim Levim go to Yerushalayim, but the Israelites, they stay in their cities. So, uh, and they they read these the Parshias. So because of that, there's, of course, question, that's a contradiction. Where were the Israelites? Did they go to Yerushalayim or did they stay in their, in their cities? So the answer that Rashi gave was that uh, there were two groups. There's the Israelites that live in Yerushalayim. The Rambam adds to that the ones that live near Yerushalayim. And... Uh, and the, there was the others that didn't live near Yerushalayim or didn't live in Yerushalayim, and they would basically go into their cities and they would have their, they would do their, um, 
their ma'amad. So it was fasting and it was uh, praying. And then there's also discussion of who would actually do the Torah readings that we're talking about over here. Rabbi? The, yes. The, the number 24, is that because there's 24 hours in the day? I don't think so. I mean, of course, everything in, in Judaism is, is connected, but uh, I didn't see any connection. Uh, I didn't see it uh, mentioned, such a such a concept. What's the 24 based on? Anything particular? Um, we're going to, we'll see in the Gemara if, the, if there's any uh, points. The Gemara is going to discuss it at length, like uh, who started, we, uh, how, originally how many were there, and then... Uh, and then how many groups were there? And then how did it develop? You know, how when it developed into 24. So we'll see when we get to it if there's any other sources. But I, I don't think it's connected to the 24 hours. I, I you know, I, again, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, um, I don't have a uh, a clear uh, uh, understanding of exactly why it's 24. But maybe when we get to the Gemara, they will see if the commentaries talk about it. So the. Uh, uh, the Gemara, uh, the Mishnah, I'm sorry, the Mishnah then, uh, so the Mishnah was talking about this uh, this idea of the two groups of Israelites, basically, which, uh, again, the Mishnah was vague, but I was mentioning that there is a discussion as to the reading of the Torah. Was that something that was done by the Israelites in Yushalayim as well? Did they also read the Torah? With these, with these extra, these special readings of the Torah, or was this only done in the cities where the Israelites congregated uh, to to pray on behalf of the Jewish people and on behalf of the sac that the sacrifices should be accepted? And um, because if you look in the Mishnah, it says they would gather in their cities. And they would read in Maise Beratius. And they would take out a Torah scroll and read about the creation of the world. And uh, uh, seemingly, it, it doesn't mention that this was done in Yushalayim. The Kainam Levim went to Yushalayim. And um, uh, Yisrael Shaba Isai, Maima the Yisrael, um, they would. Um, um, they would be the ones who would gather in their cities and uh, read the Torah. So, uh, from at least from Rashi, it sounds like only the only the ones in their cities would read the Torah. There is, of course, another opinion. Again, there's a lot of different opinions here, and I don't want to confuse you, but uh, uh, the the Rambam does hold that. Uh, even the ones in Yerushalayim would read the Torah. Now, who would fast? So uh, again, there's an argument. Would it be only the ones who were in their in 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 their cities that they would fast, or was it even the ones in Yerushalayim that would fast? Again, another machlekes. Uh, so it, it seems to be a lot of debate here as to how to learn uh, all these all these parts of all these um, um, all the ceremony all this ceremonial. Um, rituals. Now, uh, the uh, the Mishnah then continued and talked about the different readings that were done each day about creation. And I, I mentioned yesterday that creation of the world is very connected to the serving Hashem because the idea was that the whole world exists in the merit of serving Hashem in the base of the service in the base of so if the whole world exists because of the merit of the service in the base of Migdash, so basically uh, it makes sense that when we're doing the service in the base of Migdash, we talk about creation, we read about the creation of the world. Okay, and then the Mishnah continued and mentioned about the uh, the the different prayers that were done, uh, the Shachris, the Musaf, uh, that in Shachris and Musaf they would, uh, that's when they would read the Torah. But in Mincha, um, in Mincha, um, uh, they would do it individually, which means they didn't read it from a Torah scroll. They would basically read it al by by heart, and uh, uh, 
uh, when it came to uh, Neila, it doesn't say if they would read the Torah, in other words, by heart alone. They definitely didn't read it in, 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 in with a scroll and call people up, but the Mishnah doesn't just leaves it out. So um, the, uh, the, the understanding is that, or at least according to Rashi, that they would not read it in Ni'ila. And seemingly because they were maybe uh, overwhelmed from the whole day and tired, and, you know, basically their the day is, uh, they, they did enough. But uh, of course, again, we have an argument. The Rambam holds that they would read it individually, not in, not in public, but they would read it by heart and individually and um and uh even in the the question would be what the mission doesn't say it, it just says mincha um i don't know if the rambam had a different uh version or how he understood if the mission maybe the mission was saying mincha and obvious maybe obviously Ni'ila. Ni'ila was a very important prayer maybe but basically uh there's an argument here if the uh torah the words of the Torah were recited. Um, in other words, that reading of the Torah was recited at Ni'ila or not. But at Mincha, it was definitely only recited individually. It was not read with calling up people to the Torah. Now, uh, then it mentions that on Arab Shabbos was an exception where they would not even, uh, they wouldn't do all, they wouldn't do the reading of the Torah um, because of Kavada Shabbos. They were uh, they basically uh, Davin Mincha, and that was it. Now, um, uh, they wouldn't even say it. Now, seemingly, it's only a minute or two. How long does it take to say these uh, 10 verses? You know, two minutes. Uh, but uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't, uh, they wouldn't do it on Erev Shabbos. Um, they wouldn't do it uh, because of the covet of Shabbos. So they, they basically, uh, uh, did not even say it. Again, they don't even call people up. They're just saying it by heart. So uh, to me, it seems a little surprising that they that they uh, uh, did not just have everyone say it at Mincha, just like they would uh, do at Mincha on Friday, just like they did it the day before. But uh, anyway, it, uh, the Mishnah says they wouldn't cover a Shabbos. They need time to get ready for Shabbos. I guess in the olden days, it was much more complicated maybe to prepare for Shabbos. Nowadays, we have things easier. I don't know. Anyway, and then the Mishnah talked about the initial understanding of Rabbi Akiva and then Rabbi Azai's opinion. And then Rabbi Akiva basically changed his view to Ben Azai about, you know, when it gets too busy, what would they cut? Well, you know, would they cut out the Ma'amadis? So... Uh, basically, the initial uh, thought of Rabbi Akiva was if a day that you say Hallel, uh, 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 which basically is Hanukkah, so uh, you don't do the Maimed in Shachris. And here also, there's a whole question as to who are we talking about? Are we talking about the people in Yerushalayim? Or are we talking about the people around, you know, around the world uh, in, their, in, the, in their shuls? Now, uh, Rashi says, we're talking about the people in Yerushalayim. Um, so in Yerushalayim, they would cut out the Ma'amadis. So they wouldn't dive in long and, and so on. Now, according to Rashi, if you remember, we said that the people in Yerushalayim never even said the Torah. They, did, they, didn't, they didn't read the Torah. Um, it was the people around the world that would read the Torah. So according to that, when it says there's no maimed, at Shachris is talking about adding those extra prayers that they would add in the Shachris, so they wouldn't do it because they're doing Hallel, so they don't have time to, people in Yishalayim, uh, they don't have time to add uh, extra stuff in their regular prayer because the, uh, the they have to say Hallel, so it would push off the maimed. Again, think about it. Hallel is in the morning. So it pushes off the maimed of Shachris, but it's not going to have an effect on Mincha and um, and Ne'ila. There's no Musaf that day. It's Hanukkah. Hanukkah, there's no Musaf, uh, except for Rosh Chodesh, which we'll talk about later. But uh, the regular days of Hanukkah is no Musaf, so there's only Mincha and Ne'ila. So Halel messed up 
the Maimed of Shachris, but it didn't mess up anything about Mincha and Ila. Now, the uh, day that there's Musa, for example, on a Rosh Chodesh, so then yeah, the, the, the initial opinion of Rabbi Akiva was uh, you don't have a Maimed, uh, you can't add extra. Again, you're adding that you have this extra prayer, Musaf, so you don't uh, you don't uh, you don't do the Ma'amadais because you're adding an extra prayer. So we don't do the Ma'amadais even for Ni'ila because they're too busy with the Musaf. And uh, Rashi goes on to a whole thing how the Israelites have to cut the wood to bring for the the extra two animals that were brought on the on the uh, on the altar for the Musaf car, but at least two other holidays they even have more, and so basically um, they don't have time to add in the the Ma'amadis in these extra prayers. So they didn't do it for Neila, which obviously means they didn't do it for Mincha, which is right next to the Musaf. And um, uh, I mentioned yesterday that Taisus holds they don't even say Neila. That's how he learns that in Ni'ila, there is no Ni'ila. In Boy Ni'ila. It seems like Tysus had a different Girsa because our Girsa, our version says, Ain, ain Bin Ni'ila. And Tysus says, Ain Boy Ni'ila. Ain Boy Ni'ila means it doesn't have Ni'ila on that day. Ain Bin Ni'ila means you don't have Ma'amadais in Ni'ila. So it seems like maybe there was a, a question of how the wording was. If it's Boyne'ila or Bine'ila, a difference of one letter in the space. But uh, basically, uh, uh, that's the uh, that's a, another discussion in the commentaries. And uh, and then we talked about the carbon eitzim. And again, this was a donation of wood that was made into a holiday, a celebration. And if they made this extra celebration of the eitzim, of the wood, so they make a holiday out of it. So you wouldn't do a maimed uh, in Mincha. Because that's when they would basically uh, uh, do this celebration of uh, this carbonatesim. They would make this this special. Uh, they would bring extra sacrifices and so on. So basically, it would knock off the extra prayers, the ma'amadis at mincha, and that was the uh, that was the initial way of Rabbi Akiva. And then he switched things around a little. He tweaked it because of Ben Azai. Ben Azai said uh, how Rabbi Yeshua did it. He said if there's a if there's a musaf, then it messes up. The um, the mincha ma'amadis, and obviously it messed up the musaf ma'amadis, but uh, it did not change anything about shachris and neila. Again, initially we said if there's musaf, you don't even you don't do ma'amadis in neila. And uh, the new way of uh, Rabbi Yeshua uh, is that uh, that you do ma'amadis in neila. You just do. Um, you just by uh, you just uh, skip out musaf and mincha, so you don't have it mincha. And if there's carbon eights him, then you can skip out uh, in neila. But uh, because the holiday of carbon eights him would mess up the time, the ability to do these ma'amadis, these extra prayers in neila. But uh, they would still do it at mincha time. The Gemara will discuss it, and then Rabbi Akiva changes mind. Now the man atzi kayanim. We said the different times that were that were done. There was special holidays again. These nine times in the year, each of these families would uh, uh, were big donors. They donated the wood, and um, and then we said that there was one day that they had with them uh, the kainim and Leviim and anyone that made a mistake in their shavit, but they know they're from the um, um, they know they're from those that brought the wood so they know they're they're supposed to be celebrating so they would celebrate on the 15th day of the month of of um it, interesting that in the month of of seems like it had a lot of uh a lot of these celebrations the fifth day the seventh day the 10th day the 15th day and uh and the 20th day so it seems like uh of did pretty well with the carbon eats him. I guess that's when um, maybe they needed more. That 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 was when it would. I guess I guess they needed to uh, save up then from all the wood because after that the wood gets the wood gets wet, the wood gets um, moist. Like that's the something to do with the drying, which 
that the wood is more dry. In any event, um, then the Mishnah talked about one of the uh, families actually donated twice, and this was the Bnei Parush Ben Bnei Parush uh, Ben Yehuda, right? Is that is that correct? Bnei Parush Ben Yehuda. Uh, they would bring. They brought a second time, and. Um, then the Mishnah said that Rosh Chodesh Tevis is um, a day that never, that did not have any maimed at all. It was a um, it was a day that had Hallel, because it's Hanukkah, and it had Musaf, and it had Karbanetzim. So you had all these three extra things. So basically, uh, the Hallel messed up the Shachris. And uh, the Musaf uh, messed up the uh, Musaf in Mincha, and the Karban Eitzim messed up the Ma'amadais for Ne'ila. Okay, I think the Mishnah now that we've gone over it, I think it's uh, nice and clear. We're going to now start with the new part of the Mishnah, Chamisha Devarim. Um, Chamisha Devarim. And we are at the end of the page, two lines up from the bottom of the page. Five things happened to our fathers. If you are in the art scroll, let me tell you where we are. We are on 26A4. 26A4. So it says that there were five things that happened. Iru as Aviseno happened to our fathers. Now, the mission is basically going to tell us about the tiny ice that are more established. These are not the fast days that have to do with rain that are like that based on the rabbi's decree uh, each time when there's a famine or something. We're going to now hear learn about fast days, the, the uh, fast days that are uh, much more established and the reason for them. So there's five things that happen to our fathers the Shiva Asr Batamas on the 17th day of Tamas, the Hamisha, the and the five things that happened, terrible things that happened to us on Tishaba. Now, the Mishnah says the Shiva Asr Batamas on the 17th day of Tamas, we turn the page now, 26b. Nishtabru Halukhois, the tablets were broken. And they were broken by Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe broke the tablets. And um, it was the day that the Yidin were worshiping the golden calf and making a party. And Moshe Rabbeinu broke the tablets. And that was a, a very a sad time, a very terrible time. We lost all the great things that we had. At the from Mount Taira, we lost them. So the breaking of the tablets was the first thing. Then the second thing is a batala tumid, the carbon tumid, uh, the the, the uh, carbon tumid, which is the daily sacrifice, stopped, and it stopped because they decreed that they shouldn't bring the carbon tumid anymore. In the base of Mikdash, this is what Rashi Rashi says: Batala Tumid, because of Gazra Malchus Harisha, evil kingdom, which generally refers to Rome. They uh, they uh, they they prohibited us from bringing the uh, Karban Tumid, the daily sacrifice. Now. Uh, the it's brought down that there's uh, different opinions as to when exactly this was, um, and uh, the, the one opinion is it, it was in the time of the second base of Migdash and the, the Greeks, and um, but the other opinion is that it's the Romans, and uh, this would the, the Greeks basically are the story of Hanukkah which is maybe about 200 years before the destruction of the second base of and uh, the, the 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 Romans are right before the destruction of the second base of and uh, so that's basically the uh, the um, 
the understanding of this, except that there is another opinion that it's not talking about the second base amygdash at all. It's still really talking about the first base amygdash. And uh, during the first base amygdash, uh, there was some story there where they stopped uh, where they stopped bringing the carbon, the car, the carbon atomid, and um, and uh, that was a terrible, a terrible thing that the carbon tumid was was uh, was not brought. Now uh, the next thing was Hufka ear. The city was breached, and the city was breached uh, again. This is the in the time of the Romans. And um, the uh, fast day of uh, of um, Shiva Asa the, uh, the the city was broken into. Uh, Asa so there was a siege. And Shiva Asa was that the city was breached. And um, uh, it was basically three weeks um, before they actually destroyed the temple. The siege lasted close to three years, but the breaching, once they got in, three weeks later, and that's the famous three weeks that we don't do weddings in the summer, That those are the three weeks from when the city was breached until when the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed. Now, uh, the next uh, um, terrible thing that happened was the Hamid Selim Behechel, they put up a Selem, a an idol in the base Hamigdash, and uh, this was obviously a terrible disgrace for the base Hamigdash. It was a time in the time of the uh, uh, the, the second base Hamigdash, and um, uh, it was in the time of the Greeks, and they put this idol uh, in the base Hamigdash. Um, Bye. The well, only thing he doesn't learn this way. Yes, you mentioned about the uh, posthumous. Yeah. So um, it's interesting. It says uh, that this name posthumous is it's a Latin name that's given to someone that's born after his father's death. So uh -huh. in English, in English, there's a word. It's like the posthumous, which means uh, after the person died. Like po Uh huh. Right. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's an interesting... Uh, like the person was given this award uh, posthum posthumously uh, after, uh -huh. which means after the person died, he got the, uh, he won the award or something. Right, right. Okay, that's an interesting uh, etymology. The, uh, I, so anyway, the, there are two opinions that I was just, I was just mentioned, I mentioned one of them, that this was in the time of a posthumous, which we'll soon see uh, about how he burned the Torah. So he also was the one who... Oh, did I I skipped something? I'm sorry. So I skipped of Sarah for Pustumus as a Torah. First, it says that a Pustumus burned the Torah, and this was not just any Torah that was burned. This was a special Torah that was written by Ezra, and this is the Torah that they would use to check all the other Torahs to see if they're correct. And um, if I'm not mistaken, there is a Torah scroll in the city of Prague that they say was checked by the Sefer Torah. Now, this was written all the way back and was checked by the Sefer Torah of Ezra. And um, uh, in any event, so that this was like the main scroll that was used in order to check other scrolls to see if the Torah scrolls are 100% correct if they had a question of one letter or certain any any issues so they would use this this Torah for that and unfortunately it was burned by the uh, Greek general Apostomus. Isn't there something uh, about a, um, a Torah scroll that has an alpha instead of a hey? So um, yeah, so then there's a there's a there's a, there's a yeah. So that that's like a continuation of what I was. Uh, mentioning that uh, when the Lubavitcher Rebbe was there in Prague, he checked out this Torah to see how is Pitsua Daka spelled? Because there's a big argument in the Poiskim 
uh, how to spell. There's one letter that's questionable in all of our Torahs, and that is the letter the uh, Aleph or Hey, the end of a word called Daka, Dalid Chaf. The first two letters are Dalid Chaf. It either has a Hey at the end or an Aleph at the end. And it has to do with a person who has a wound and could be considered that they're a certain wound if it makes them um, like unable to have kids or something. So anyway, that that uh, that that pasuk is uh, a debate, and it ends up being a big debate even today. And there are some Torah scrolls that have a hey, and some Torah scrolls that have an aleph. And uh, so the, when the Lubavitch Rebbe was there, he checked out. He wanted to check out that Torah scroll, which I believe it says that that scroll was was tested by was you know they checked it obviously many years earlier in the time of the Greeks before uh, Apostemus burned Ezra's Torah. But I think it says that it was it was checked. Well, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if it's Salah. There is a Hayyamim about this. Uh, uh, and I think it mentions that, that that Torah was what was so unique. Or, or, or something about the Maharami Rutenberg. It was a Torah from, written by the Maharami Rutenberg. Maybe that's what it was. Anyway, there's a, a special thing about that Torah that it has a, it's a very reliable Torah. Just reminds me of this. I, 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 for some reason, in the back of my mind, I have this thought that it was, it was Czech, but that would mean that it's very old. That, that would mean that it's 2000 uh, years old. And maybe that's, maybe that doesn't make sense. I have to look it up. Okay. I don't know for sure. Uh, but it's something about the Maharami Rutenberg uh, had this, uh, had this scroll and, um, uh, it's a very reliable Torah scroll, similar maybe then to this idea of Ezra's scroll that was the main Torah scroll that they used to test, to check up every other, any other Torah. Anyway, so that's one interpretation here, that a Pustumus burned that very important Torah. There's, there is another interpretation here, and that is a Pustumus tried to burn every Torah that he could get his hands on, in order to forget that Judaism should be re, uh, just uh, ended and kill and destroy. And so he tried to burn every single Torah. And so that's why this is considered such a terrible, um, terrible day. It didn't wasn't just like one Torah scroll burned, but it was either the most valuable Torah scroll in, in spiritually, or it was the uh, the fact that he tried to burn many, he burned many Torahs. The Hemed Selim Beheichal, and then comes this uh, that he put its Selim in the Heichal, and the the uh, basically there's two interpretations here. When exactly was this that there was an image that was brought into the into the uh, Heichal sanctuary? And according to one opinion, Rashi brings the opinion that it was in the time of Menashe. Menashe was one of the uh, kings. From the Malchus uh, based David, but uh, unfortunately he was a very wicked king, and he uh, he uh, put a selam, put a idol in the heichal, and uh, uh, according to the other opinion, this is uh, and, and he put it on Shivas of Thomas. According to the other opinion, Shivas of Thomas was when Apostomus who burned the Taira, he also put an idol in the base Hamigdash. And again, Apostomus was in the time of the Greeks. And um, it, that, that means it was approximately 200 years before the uh, second Beis Hamikdash destruction. So that would be like, uh, I guess, 200 BCE. I'm just giving a approximate. Um, the, the Mishnah continues and says that Betishabav, on Tishabav, there was another five things that happened. So there was a decree against our fathers that they should not enter Eretz Yisrael. And this has to do with the uh, spy, the spies that came back and put a bad, they, they, they gave a negative report and got the Jewish people all uh, angry and not interested in going to Eretz Yisrael. And uh, so that they, they caused that Hashem made this decree. And of course, the famous say, the famous line is, "You cried a bechia shalchinam. You cried for nothing. I will give you something to cry for." That was Hashem's line to them. You're crying 
in response to the uh, negative report of the spies and you don't want to go to Eretz Yisrael, now I'll give you something to cry for and you will all die in the desert over the next 40 years and um, and you won't enter Eretz Yisrael. And uh, then came the next uh, tragedy and that is the first base of Migdash and the second base of Migdash were both destroyed on Tisha B'Av. And Nilka, the Betar, the city of Betar, was captured, conquered in on Tisha B'Av. And uh, Rashi says this was a very big city and uh, the Yidin, it was a Jewish city, the Yidin lived there and it was conquered on um um, on Tisha B'Av. Now, um, it's brought down that it was 52 years after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. It fell to the Romans, and they killed every single Yid. It was a terrible, terrible uh, tragedy. It was considered as great as the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. Now, uh, Uh, the city was plowed under. And what that means is that in the, the uh, second Beis Amigdash, the Roman general plowed uh, over the uh, Beis Amigdash. Um, and um, uh, this was uh, obviously considered a terrible. Uh, disgrace for the Beis Hamikdash, Nech and um, altogether that makes five. The the what, what are the five? Uh, they can't enter Eretz Yisrael. The first Beis Hamikdash destroyed. The second Beis Hamikdash destroyed. Beitar and the city was plowed was plowed under. And Misha uh, Nasav Mimatin Basimcha. And because of this, when we add, when when Av enters, we we lessen our joy and. Um, and the Hasidic shot over here is Misha Nechnasov Mematim. Of comes, we have to lessen our joy, but we do it besimcha. We do it with joy. Uh, now, uh, the Misha continues and says, Shabbos Shachol Tishabav Liyos Besecha. Shabbos that Tishabav falls uh, in uh, the, 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 the week that the, the Tishabav falls, the Shabbos, the uh, the, the the week of uh, that the week that Tisha B'av falls in that week Leospesecha inside that week also from the Saper Lachabis we're not allowed to take haircuts and we don't uh, wash our clothes Lachamishi but on the, the Thursday Mutar Negev Shabbos on Thursday you're allowed to because of the honor of Shabbos Erev Tisha B'av on the day the eve of Tisha B'av the uh, there is a rule of how of not eating more not eating two Tavshil Loyacheladim Shnei Tavshilim which means the meal right before the fast. You're not supposed to eat two cooked foods. We uh, basically only eat one cooked food. We eat eggs and we have some burnt ashes and we have bread. But the cooked foods is only one, is eggs. But uh, the law is you're not allowed to eat two cooked foods. You're not allowed to eat meat or drink wine. And uh, seemingly that only applies then according to the letter of the law. We add to all these laws and we prohibit it. Well, there's a difference between Ashkenazic Jews and Sephardic Jews, but we prohibit a lot of these things even for three weeks. We don't take haircuts and um, launder clothes. We do for nine days from Rosh Chodesh of, and um, and uh, we don't eat meat and drink wine also from Rosh Chodesh of. Uh, I think Sephardic people start everything from the Shabbos before Tisha B'av, but even they are adding on to the letter of the law, because according to the letter of the law, meat and wine only applied on Erev Tisha B'av, and, um, um, and basically the minhag became that we that we add on to, the, uh, to, to, to these laws. There's a whole discussion about wearing Shabbos clothes on Shabbos before Tisha B'av. And uh, uh, is it appropriate to wear Shabbos on Tisha B'av uh, wear Shabbos clothes on Tisha B'av. And uh, because that's the week of Tisha B'av, and so should you wear Shabbos clothes? And um, uh, it seems that the minimum became that everyone wears Shabbos clothes, and uh, which means that we're machmir, we're mahader, Shabbos, and we are makel, 
we are more lenient in the laws of Avelos. But uh, uh, in any event, uh, the seemingly the Mishnah is telling us the letter of the law and the minhag became to add on to these. We don't listen to music for three weeks and so on. We don't do weddings. Uh, and the Mishnah continues and says, Reb Shimon Gamliel, Aymer Yeshana, Reb Shimon ben Gamliel says, you have to make some type of a change, which we'll see on the Gemara what that means. Reb Yehuda, Machayev, the Kfiyas Hamita, Reb Yehuda obligated those to uh, that we should turn over the bed on Tisha B'av and not sleep on the mattress, but instead turn it over. The understanding is that this had to do with the laws of mourning, which we don't follow nowadays turning over the bed. And the reason from my understanding is that in the olden days, they turned over the bed because the bed could be used both sides, but the one side was comfortable and the other side was not as comfortable. Nowadays, the mattresses, if you have a regular mattress that has two sides to it, so it's no difference if you turn over the mattress or if you put it straight up, it's going to be the same comfort. And if you have a bed that uh, has metal on the bottom or wood or something like that, uh, if you try to turn it over, you won't be able to fall asleep. So the concept of kfiyas hamita uh, somehow was... Uh, annulled. It was uh, basically, uh, it's not, the minog is, it's not to do it anymore. But um, anyway, that the, uh, the the Mishnah here talks about Kfiyah Samita regarding Tishabav. So Yehuda was Machayev to turn over the beds for Tishabav. And similar again, this all, it's a concept of mourning. And the Lehoidu Lechachamim, the rabbis did not agree with Rabbi Yehuda. Now the Mishnah continues and says, Amr Reb Shem Gamliel, Shem Gamliel says that um, actually, I'm, I, I'm looking at Rashi now. Maybe what I said is not correct. Rashi says that they turned over the bed and they would not sleep on it. So I wonder if Rashi means that even on the opposite side, they wouldn't sleep on. That would be interesting. That means Rashi would would hold that they would just turn it over and not even use it. Let me just see if the commentary, uh, on Ra I have a commentary on Rashi here. Let's see if he learns it that way. Rabbi Steinzelt says they would overturn the bed and sleep on the floor. Uh-huh, right. That's like, what it like one is in the, Like one is in a state of mourning. Okay, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe the minog was never to sleep on the opposite side of it. That's not as comfortable. I guess I guess that's wrong. I have to look it up then. Uh, the 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 concept because Rashi seems to say Rashi seems to say not like uh, the way I translated it. Rashi says they would sleep on the floor, and it seems that that's maybe the way they did it for Avelus as well. Uh, that they would sleep uh, on the floor. They would turn over the bed and sleep on the floor. Um, and uh, in any event, uh, the Mishnah, oh boy, it's 11.01. Okay, so we're going to stop here and to be continued tomorrow, Metz Hashem. Zayi everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Rabbi. Have a great day, everybody. Mm -hmm.